Welcome, everything is fine. You are listening to Forking Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We're the Diamond Delete VIP Club of the Afterlife, and I guess we'll let you in this time. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 2, A Girl from Arizona, Part 2. It was written by Andrew Law and Cassia Miller, directed by Drew Goddard, and it aired October 3rd, 2019. The team chooses to focus their efforts on Brent. By means of a talk show, they try to make Brent realize he doesn't belong here. It fails, so they create a chaos sequence the following morning. Brent understands immediately that he doesn't belong in the good place. He belongs in the best place. Look, this chaos, which is clearly all about me, is a sign. If this is the good place, I belong in the best place. So, figure it out. Get back to me, okay? The team doubts Eleanor's leadership. They wonder if someone else should be in charge. When she overhears their complaints, she quits and storms out. Michael follows her and they have a heart-to-heart, and he tells her she's exactly the right person for the task. Like it or not, the only one who can save humanity is a girl from Arizona. Eleanor decides to tell Brent he's right. There is a best place. They explain that only a small group of the most morally upstanding citizens will go there. The best place is reserved for a select upper echelon of good people. Sort of like a diamond elite VIP club of afterlife residents. Thereby manipulating him to be kind and thoughtful. They hope that eventually he will start doing good things out of habit. Janet delivers upsetting news to Jason. She can't be in a relationship with him right now, and the Jacksonville Jaguars cut Blake Bortles. To honey comforts Jason. Eleanor recruits Chidi to help with Simone by telling him Simone is his soulmate. He's elated, and he decides to help. He challenges Simone's solipsism and encourages her to treat everyone with kindness and respect, just in case the afterlife is real. I mean, what do you you have to lose by treating people with kindness and respect? Okay, keep talking. Probably fake, but maybe real philosopher man. So I want to start this episode off by saying I called it. Yeah, Uh uh-huh, twice. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I know V was watching the TV and audibly was like, yes, yes. I called it. I called it. I totally (laughs) called it. So some of you might remember that I was joking around last episode about Brent thinking that he's so good. He deserves to go to the best place if this is just the good place, right? And we talked about solipsism, so it was nice to hear that actual word dropped in this episode, too. Yeah, maybe they uh, maybe they quickly did a scene oh, in, the, yeah. in the week that it, the episodes <laughs> aired, just to throw that in. In the, uh, what, sorry, what was it, day and a half-ish that yeah, we gave them? totally. They were just like, oh my gosh, gotta rewrite that, gotta put that in. <laughs> Quick, we gotta shoot another scene. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was quite excited about that. So I just want to start off by asking, what did you think of the talk show? I don't know. The talk show was the talk show. It seemed kind of try hardy. Oh, <laughs> like, like try hardy from Eleanor or the yeah, show? Yeah, like it was quite the, uh, it was quite the presentation. It was very, I don't know, it's... It's hard for me to explain how I felt about that. Um, I think I just feel like it was very much uh, putting Brent on the spot, trying to get something out of him. Right. I don't know. Okay. I thought it was a risky move. Yeah? Yeah. How come? Because putting someone on a talk show, someone like Brent on a talk show, who likes to be the center of attention and who seems to have absolutely no remorse for his actions, isn't going to help, I don't think. I don't think that he's paying attention very much when he's listening. I'm pretty sure that's clear when he calls the lady, oh, the woman who saved all the ducks. The duck lady. Yeah. He just calls her the duck lady because he probably heard that one word. And he calls Cheaty Chad, which is unacceptable. (laughs) Ugh. I just don't think it's a very good move. Plus, then it exposes Brent and his awfulness to the other residents. Like, Chidi... they're still fake residents. Yeah, but Chidi, Simone are not. I wonder if Simone was even there. Okay, Chidi, Simone, and John are not fake residents, right? right? So, John, not a great guy, so he might not think 
too hard about why Brent is in the good place, mm-hmm. but there was a little shot of Cheedy kind of looking confused yeah, when Brent was talking. You're right. And I just felt like that was a poor move on her part. I think it was partly because it's been three days. She is exhausted. They're trying to come up with something. They're grasping at straws. Mm-hmm. I get that. I think it might come back to bite them in the butt. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do we really need to save the ducks? I mean, what's wrong with the ducks? Do they need saving? I guess. I looked it up. <laughs> they're not really that endangered. <laughs> They're not. There's like... But they're not endangered because she saved them, Jason. And, and the, the horses. horses. Were the she horses didn't an brag, issue? But the horses, too. I'm sure there's a few species of horse <laughs> that are, you know, in trouble. But I guess not anymore. <laughs> okay, let's do a little, little wiggle. Okay. See? Yeah, but let's... So Brent Norwalk, I feel like Brent, I feel like the name Brent Norwalk is very purposefully done in because Norwalk is a really crappy, pardon the pun, <laughs> um, virus. virus to get. You're basically toilet bound, whether you're sitting on it or cradling it because you're pooping or puking. Which is very apt because that's how I feel when I see Brent. He <laughs> makes me want to vomit. He's disgusting. Um, Eleanor's comment earlier in the, uh, in the episode about how Brent thinks the world revolves around him and he's kind of right. That's mm-hmm. because he's what? Straight white male. Yep. Privileges. Yes. yes. He is a very privileged, straight, white, cisgender, able-bodied man. There you go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really liked the chaos sequence. Seeing it again was a lot of fun, uh, especially with Brent in mind because I feel like he deserves it. The Princeton Tiger, the striped outfits, but now in orange and black, which are also very appropriate for this spooky season that mm. we're in right now. Halloweeny. Yeah. The Perrier rain, the golf balls that say in Titleist, the SUVs racing around the neighborhood. Like, all of it is good. It's just so funny. When the residents are running from the big in Titleist golf balls, I was uh, going in slow motion. You can see a bunch of them in the background just kind of laughing and like, <laughs> hey, we're extras. This is fun. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But it works enough with the Janet babies as well because they might not fear for their life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Although I suppose nobody in the good place would really fear for that's their life true. anymore. But it's still, it's only like day it's three. Re- yeah. So they're not getting used to the whole... We don't die. We don't feel pain. We don't get threatened. Yeah. Yeah. This made me think of what a chaos sequence would have if it were revolved around you or if it revolved around me. Hmm. And <laughs> I don't know. What do you think would be in your chaos sequence? I don't know. I didn't really think about it. Well, I think that there <laughs> would be uh, characters from... Some of the video games that you love to play, Path of Exile and League of Legends, maybe a giant... Teemo? Yes. There would be a giant Teemo, maybe, and one of the characters that you made up in Path of Exile, I think. And there would be photo booths everywhere, taking pictures of you all the time. But the nightmare would be... Oh, man. (laughs) Oh, no, what? It would just be people that never stare at the camera. They always look at themselves on the screen. Look at the camera. That's what a camera is. Or people that constantly move before the flash. Oh, that's the worst. Okay, (laughs) if you're in a photo booth, just FYI, anybody out there, if you're at a wedding or a party and there's a photo booth, wait for the flash to go off before you start taking off your props and going like, oh, what a funny picture. No, it hasn't taken yet. Wait for the flash. (laughs) so annoying <laughs> so just, that that would be in your chaos just sequence. work problems guys <laughs> and there'd be like a lazy river of rice and beans and weenies because that is like your go-to lazy meal that sounds like heaven <laughs> unless i can't get out of it it's like quicksand yeah yeah, yeah. right then there you go <laughs> okay so for you i'm thinking of okay if we're gonna go with foods then it's tofu just gross tofu not like flavored tofu or anything it's like the raw i mean tofu is always raw until you cook it 
I guess that's true with anything. <laughs> Most <laughs> but like, things, yeah. It's like the tofu that comes in the package, it's all wet and slimy. Oh, and, then you and you have haven't to, pressed it yet. You haven't pressed oh. it, and it's slapping, and it's slapping against the pavement, chasing after you, like going... <laughs> slap, 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 <laughs> and it's spraying its juices oh, everywhere. Gross. And there's a towel everywhere. There's like towels you can just grab, but they're already wet. Oh, man. Oh, that's the worst. I feel like Buffy has to make an appearance in my chaos sequence. Yeah, but she doesn't like you. Damn it. I love you, Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Although, no, no, there's there's also spikes everywhere. There's Spike Ooh, the character. Right. He just, but he keeps getting dusted. Like, he oh, keeps man. dying over and over again. Terrible. Okay. I invite all of you guys to think about what would be in your chaos sequence and send it to us because... I want to read that super bad. <laughs> so yeah, I really liked the, that attempt. Um, obviously it didn't work out, but then when they decide to actually speak Brent's language by telling him he's right. And that the best place is like the diamond elite VIP club. That was mwah, French kiss, chef kiss, whatever. Not French kiss. That's with tongues. French kiss the chef. Yeah. French kiss the chef. There you go. <laughs> That was perfect. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, that was the right thing to do. That was perfect. Yeah. Um, Just backtracking quickly to Brent's game show, oh, where yes. he mentions that he bought Netflix stock smartly. Um, that is really wise. When he bought Netflix stock at $38, it was around 2011. Hmm. And um, it's now sitting at about 270 Oh, okay. At well, this time of recording, it's actually two seventy four sixty. Um, but if you're interested in purchasing some, I wouldn't because Netflix stock is actually pretty volatile right now. It's not as volatile as like Bitcoin or anything, but it is definitely a very fluctuating stock in the past six months. Um, it's actually peaked at three hundred eighty five dollars and ninety nine cents, mm. but has taken a big dive and um has been in a downfall ever since for the past like six months mm -hmm. so with all those competing streaming net yeah networks. all these things are popping up and netflix's original series aren't doing so well their new original series canceling their other ones <sighs> save, save away. away save away <laughs> Okay, so when he said I bought it at $38, I know nothing about the stock market. Like, literally threw out everything you could know about the stock market, and that's how much I know. Well, if he... I was like, oh, $38, I mean, that doesn't seem like a great price. Back when Netflix started, it was like a buck or two. Right. But if he had sold when he died, he would have made a pretty penny. Depends on how many stocks he bought. But. At least it'll go to his child, who hopefully isn't as piece of shirty as he is. Oh, his kid's probably horrible. Ah, let me imagine that maybe he has learned his lesson. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So the reason that I really like this direction is because it's a total parallel to season one Eleanor. Um, it's virtue theory all again. So virtue theory emphasizing character instead of following a strict set of rules like Kant. Um, so basically, if Brent just focuses on being a good person, he's going to eventually just do good things without making an effort. Mm -hmm. um, Aristotle, who is really the one who uh, who talked about this a lot, he said that we should try to become virtuous because it's what we're meant to do. We're meant to grow and change, which is exactly what this experiment is about. And it's a skill. Virtue is a skill. It's not something that you are necessarily born with, but it is something that you practice and that you get better at every day. So I like that this is the direction they went with. And it's funny to see these little moments like Brent picking up the fork and being really nice and asking Eleanor, oh, did you, did you get that? Or should I write it all down for you? Because it reminds me of Eleanor in season one, when she was so happy about letting someone cut in front of her in line for frozen yogurt. And she comes back to tell Chidi about it. But when she does that, that was unintentional. Like she didn't 
mean to do it yeah. for extra points. No. Which is which was a huge step for her. Yeah. And so maybe at some point that's how Brent will be, right? Mm-hmm. He will do something without realizing and come over to Eleanor and Michael and say, Hey, hey, guess what I did today? And I didn't even think about it. Do you so. think he's redeemable? You <sighs> think that no. can happen? No, I, don't I don't think so either. I do not think they will redeem him. I just think it's interesting because we're doing the same right. method for Eleanor and hoping it'll work. I mean, but I think they're two different people and it won't. Him, I still like the method. <laughs> him even saying like, did, did you get the fork thing? Like, do yeah. I, should I write these things down? It's like the accountants keeping track of yeah. everyone's points, mm-hmm. which, yeah. Yeah. Another little thing that I like about Brent, which... I don't like anything about Brent. I like what the show does with Brent. Just to clarify. Just to clarify. I like that he's always wearing a shirt with his company logo on it. Because, of course, he's that guy. Hmm? It's got to show everyone who he works for or like what his business name is. Oh, yeah, I run this company. And that he's a success. Ugh. And having a giant breakfast of surf and turf plus a giant Caesar, uh, a glass of scotch and a cigar... It's breakfast. Okay, bud. I mean, I guess this is the good place you can have whatever you want for breakfast, but I hate him. What's surf and turf? Um, surf and turf is seafood and uh, beef of some kind. Okay. So he had a giant steak yes. and a giant lobster. I'm not a seafood guy, so I don't. Yeah, eat surprising that. that me as a vegetarian knows yeah. what surf and turf <laughs> and <I> is. Don't. <laughs> So. Yeah, his Caesar had so many celery stalks. So like, many. So many. And it had um, a lime wedge as well. Ugh. And something else that looked like it might have been uh, like a crab leg sticking out of it. It looked disgusting. Are Caesars a big thing in the States? I feel like they're a very Canadian drink. Yeah, I feel like they're pretty Canadian as well. But uh, maybe that's just me. They also seem gross. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, it's. I don't know. I, I like the method here. I think that the big difference we're going to see is that Brent doesn't have people supporting him to make ethical choices. He has Eleanor and Michael, but that's like a boss. He doesn't have a friend to encourage him in the right direction. And he's not learning about the value of his actions. He's not learning about philosophy and understanding why it is good to do these things other than A, it'll get me into the Diamond Elite VIP club, whatever. Right, but... Maybe next episode, he's going to be in the study group with everyone else. Perhaps. I think we got to get that study group together pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So what did you think of Eleanor's journey in this episode? Eleanor had a satisfying journey. Okay. I liked how it went, the ups and the downs. Mm -hmm. It seemed very familiar. Mm. (laughs) Do you have any thoughts on that? I... I didn't really like the scene with Michael and Eleanor in the middle of the episode. I think this is my biggest complaint about the episode because... Okay, let me explain. I feel like this episode would have been much better served as a second half... So much better. ...of a one-hour premiere. Yes, absolutely. The the whole timeline, the whole pacing of the episode was way off because of that. Yeah. I feel like it was definitely meant to be... A one part, like a full hour long episode. I really think so too, because Eleanor's breakdown happened in the middle of this episode, literally like 10 minutes into a 20 minute episode. It was very weird. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was rushed and I sort of wondered what was going to come after that breakdown. Um, I think because it was its own episode, it felt really quick to me. Right. Yes. And so I wasn't ready to be there emotionally with Eleanor, I think. And so I had a bit of a harder time connecting right, with that moment. Right, because we haven't spent that much time with them this episode. And then all of a sudden it's, let's kick her when she's down. And But I saw a lot of praise about that scene online. Oh. A lot of people really liked it. And I'm, I'm not here to say that Ted Danson and Kristen Bell didn't do a great job. I think they killed the scene. They were great. Right. That scene in a vacuum was amazing. But in the sense of the episode. With the structure was just a little off for me. It didn't feel as satisfying. And when, I don't know. 
I thought it was the best acting I've seen of Kristen Bell this show. Wow. So far since the beginning. Okay. It was r- right now, if before this episode, if you had asked me what the best scene of hers was emotionally, I would have said when she was in the Bed Bath yes. & Beyond with the plunger <laughs> right. and the toothbrushes yes. and getting all sad. The scene was funny itself, but when you think about it, it was really depressing. Right. So. Okay. When Eleanor's voice breaks and she says, I cannot do this. You know, that gave me a little lump in my throat. Okay, I'm I'm human. And then hearing her call herself a girl from Arizona instead of an Arizona trash bag was mm-hmm. a nice moment. Um, I think it's significant for her. I just... The structure really threw me off this episode and I had a very hard time with that scene. I felt kind of... You said it felt familiar. I feel like it's a little repetitive. We've seen Eleanor face these kinds of circumstances before and Michael is the one who tends to reach out to her. I think it would have been different if it had been the rest of them because Michael really wasn't on their side. Mm Mm-hmm. He kind of had to be convinced and all the others were saying, no, I think we need a new team leader. I think it would have been, I don't know, different had it not been just the two of them again. Mm -hmm. But I don't, you know, I don't think that it's ridiculous to love the scene. I think the scene is fantastic, but would have been served better as a one hour premiere. (laughs) That's how I feel. I feel like her fears of like, I've, made a mess of my own life and now i'm supposed to save everyone yeah (laughs) Um, it sounds a little silly but i feel like i'm afraid that her fears are gonna be my fears when i become a dad oh i get that (laughs) yeah no that makes sense like i did a bad job being in charge of my own life and now i'm supposed to look after this other life yeah but then it's like i'm not qualified who allowed this to happen (laughs) oh well, yeah, it's it's this it's very scary when I think of this scene, it makes perfect sense that she would panic because this is an enormous responsibility on her shoulders. And the weight of that, the guilt would be unbearable if she did fail. And she doesn't have the opportunity to fail 800 times like Michael does. Mm-hmm. He says, you know, oh, well, you can try a thousand things and fail and then try the thousandth and first thing. But Eleanor has one shot at this. That's pretty darn scary. It seem, it feels very familiar to the scene in the end of the final episode of season three mm-hmm. when Michael basically has his breakdown and wants to quit. Right. And says, I can't do this. The weight of the whole situation is too big. Right. Because he's thinking about his new friends being tortured for all eternity thinking that it's him doing the torturing and i mean it's slightly different circumstances but he's still completely burdened with the the responsibility right of if this experiment goes wrong then we're screwed eleanor's thinking a bit more um globally yes eleanor's (laughs) thinking more globally whereas michael was definitely thinking more of you know these are my friends and i don't want them to be tortured thinking it's me yes well, they bring that up in this episode. Eleanor says to Michael, yeah. oh, you pretended to have a breakdown, but you just really wanted me to take charge, right? So what's with that? I'm thinking by the tones of our voices right now, neither of us think that's legit. Yeah. I don't believe that. That reaction was really weird. And every reaction that Ted Danson does in this show is very purposeful. Mm-hmm. And he was very awkward and sheepish and uncomfortable. And it almost seemed like he didn't know what she was talking about. Yeah, I didn't. I felt like it was weird. He just said, oh, guilty. And I didn't buy it. I really didn't buy it. Well, especially since Eleanor says, you tricky devil. Yeah. And he just like. That's an interesting one, too. We don't tend to say the word devil on this show we say demon but not devil yeah which i get it it's it's an expression sly devil or sneaky Mm -hmm. devil i get that but it seems important i don't know yeah and earlier on when eleanor was and earlier on when michael is with janet and everyone else and janet suggests the new leadership Mm -hmm. michael's reaction to that was very neutral it wasn't like 
what are you talking about? Eleanor's doing a great job. Like, yeah. you guys need to cut her some slack or blah, blah, blah. It was very, oh, what? Oh, what do you mean? Like, it, it just, it came across very flat. Right. He seemed to be willing to hear all of their arguments and made the remark that, you know, it was a good point when Jason said, hey, screwing up is my thing and you wouldn't put me in charge, mm-hmm. right? So, I don't know. It, it just... I don't think that he intended for Eleanor to be the team leader in any way. I think that he's just going along with it Mm -hmm. and has maybe at this point realized that, yeah, what I said is true and a human being should be in charge of this because I'm not human. Mm -hmm. And so these unfortunate circumstances kind of ended up being okay. Maybe it's just going to end up being some joke about Eleanor thinking Michael is smarter and more deliberate than he really is we know he's not yeah he's not (laughs) okay so if you don't have more to say about eleanor michael i wanted to talk about jason i think that he had some really good moments in this episode i was quite proud of him when he finally understood that wanting to do something is not a good enough reason to do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i was proud of him for just accepting that janet wants a break and that she can't be in a relationship with him. He didn't argue. He didn't he understands. Argue, yeah. You know? I'm wondering now where they're going to go with this story, though. Like, Jason and Janet, what are they going to do with that? Anything? Nothing? Yeah. Rebound with Tahani. Yeah? No. They've they've already... <laughs> they've done that. They've done that. I If they do that, then they're just retreading the same water. Right. If that's the expression. Unless the relationship is different this time, Mm -hmm. I suppose. I just think it's a little odd because we spent, you know, a chunk of screen time last season getting the two of them together to abandon it in the second episode of this season. Right. Which feels reminiscent of the final season of How I Met Your Mother (laughs) and how we spent the entire season at Barney and Robin's wedding and then they get divorced in the final episode. Wow, thanks for not wasting our time, guys. Also, really, Ted? Robin is the person you picked? Okay, whatever. Victoria! He was was awful anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, I just feel like it can't be for nothing. I don't really want to do Tahani and Jason again. I don't think that they're meant to be in any way. No, it's going to be back with Janet because Janet's going to be freed of all her responsibilities very soon. The whole neighborhood's going to need to be shut down or something i don't know she's gonna be realize that she misses jason and that right. he was really helping her calm things down whereas she thinks that he's just making mm. things confusing or maybe jason needs to just be on his own to grow right perhaps that is what it is i don't know if you've met jason mendoza before but he doesn't really grow i wasn't too i like i was impressed with jason and his growth mm-hmm And then he went and reverted back to his old self when Michael asks him if he knows why he made him a monk. And he says, oh, was it because of the TV show Monk? I'm like, Jason, (laughs) you've had three seasons. You know why he made you a monk. It's because being quiet and being silent was torture for you. Yeah, but it's an obvious joke. Well, it's not an obvious joke if you haven't watched Monk, which I haven't. I think it was kind of a bad joke. Yeah, it wasn't great. I think there's some real flops in this episode. Like, that joke didn't work for me. And then the recurring joke about Eleanor smelling and not showering really didn't work for me. Because Kristen Bell looks beautiful. Nobody believes that she stinks. No! Eleanor probably smells like. Oh, well, okay, never mind. Not Eleanor. But Kristen Bell probably smells like a rainforest. In a good way. Slightly misty. A little tropical. Yes. There's always a bit of a... A little miraculous. Hmm. Yeah. Just like that. So, I don't believe it. Plus, come on. If she hadn't showered in like several days, she would look disheveled. She would have greasy hair. Yeah. Do not even. That joke does not work. Does not work. So, yes. He makes a stupid joke about Monk from the TV show Monk. I didn't look up the TV show, did you? Can you read people's minds? I think he's a detective or something, or a psychiatrist. I don't know. Psychic, psychiatrist, detective. Mm, I like that. If that's not a show, CW will do it. (laughs) 
So how did you feel when Janet had to give him the really unfortunate news? I've been waiting for that for like two years. (laughs) (laughs) What, about them breaking up? No, about (laughs) Blake Bortles. Right. That was a pretty sad moment. I appreciate Janet saying, I am genuinely sorry about this. I believed it, but she still should have waited. You don't give a guy two things of bad news. Did you feel sad about Janet and Jason breaking up? His reaction is what was sad for me. Yeah, I think so too. It's tough. Like, Janet is so busy at the moment that we barely see her in this episode. And then when she breaks up with Jason, who she has loved for three seasons, it's kind of emotionless. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just says, oh, it's fun to be with you, but it's not always easy. And I think it's going to endanger the experiment. There's no tearful goodbye like Chidi and Eleanor have, Mm -hmm. which makes sense. It's a different situation, but she's pretty emotionless in that moment, which is weird for our current Janet, who experiences a lot of human emotion. Right. And she's not very kind to Eleanor. She tries to just justify her comments about her with math, Mm -hmm. you know, saying, mathematically speaking, you're kind of pooching it. It's tough to hear. Yeah. Janet's not being the greatest this episode. She's not being very empathetic. So for all those conspiracy theorists that think it's not our Janet, right. then that's just more fuel for the fire. Exactly. I don't know. Hopefully it's just that she's too busy at the moment. Yeah. Shall we move on to our last but not least, Cheaty? With you, Cheaty, it's never the least. Exactly. How did you feel about him in this episode? I liked seeing more of him. Mm -hmm. It felt like a happy cheaty. Yeah. And that was sad. But (laughs) it was still nice to see him kind of cheerful and playful with Simone and just in a generally good mood. Yeah. Honestly, whenever he was with Eleanor in the first season, he was kind of on edge because she would put him on edge. Yeah. She was difficult for him to guide. Yeah, I mean, they have an entire episode about that and how he feels like she's a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough because he seemed pretty happy before he found out she wasn't a soulmate. And now he just has a soulmate. He can relax. It's tough. I feel very conflicted. The writers are doing a good job with this because they've made him so much happier in this season than we've ever seen him. So... But Eleanor's right. Like, he fell in love with Simone in the second life. Yes. After they died, technically. (laughs) Yeah. So they already know they're well matched. Mm -hmm. It's just sad for... And Simone's a nice person. Yeah. So it's easy to to like them. Yeah. It's a tough... It's a tough place because I think it's putting us in Eleanor's shoes. Like, we know Chidi as well as she does. Right. And... We're seeing him happy, and that's wonderful because you want that for him. But it's just so sad that it can't be with the person you want, you know. But you can't hate the person that he's with because (laughs) she's also great, so that's tough. Uh, Yeah. I really, I liked Chidi a lot in this episode. I thought he was really adorable when Eleanor was telling him that he's got a soulmate. It's so nice for him. I don't know. It's just, it, it's another choice he doesn't have to make. It's a choice already made for him cosmically by the universe. So yeah. this is destined. There's, it's foolproof. And he's pretty adept at flirting when he's with Simone. He was quite flirtatious. There were vibes. I know, but it, they were I think vibing. it was unintentional. I don't think he was trying to flirt. I think he was just, he was just in his element of talking about philosophy mm. and talking about the things that he knows about. So it was just effortless. If somebody had told him before, like, Chidi, right. you're going to go in here and you're going to flirt with someone. <laughs> there would be stomach aches galore. <laughs> He'd just be doubling over backwards. Yeah, he just has to not think about it. And then he is naturally flirty. Yeah. Sparks were flying between those two men. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I really like that scene. That was good. Mm-hmm. And I like the way that Eleanor explained soulmates. She says everyone has people they're cosmically bound to, and the system brings them together in the afterlife. And I like that she kept it a little less focused on the romance mm-hmm. and more on just you're connected to these people cosmically. Right. And it yeah. made me think of the entire group as they're always finding each other and they're finding a way back to each other, and they've 
kind of been stuck together in this adventure. So it's like now they're all cosmically bound. And even though Chidi is not her boyfriend, her partner at this point, he's still bound to her. Right. She still feels those tethers, I guess. It's like lost. Yeah, it is. They're all connected. Yeah. On or off the island. That's right. In or out of the afterlife. Yeah. In this show. So do you have any more thoughts about this episode? Well, actually I do. When Chidi and Eleanor are discussing Simone, he gets kind of excited because Mm -hmm. there's different uh, philosophers that he could discuss when talking about uh, simulated realities. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to quickly go over some of these philosophers. He mentions uh, Zhang Zhu. Okay. Who is like super old, by the way. (laughs) He was born in 369 BC. Wow. So like he's got some wrinkles. His uh, Zhang Zhu's ideal was uh, on dream theory was his most well known is the butterfly dream. And it's quoted as saying, once Zhang Zhu dreamed he was a butterfly, a butterfly flittering and fluttering about happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He didn't know that he was Zhang Zhu. Suddenly he woke up and there he was, solid and unmistakable Zhang Zhu. But he didn't know if he was Zhang Zhu, who had dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming that he was Zhang Zhu. Ah, so what's reality and what is a dream? Right. Okay, very cool. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, Descartes, when talking about dreams, uh, he says, Whatever I have accepted until now as most true has come to me through my senses. But occasionally I have found that they have deceived me, and Mm -hmm. it is unwise to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. Interesting. So his idea was basically, fool me once. No. I shouldn't trust you. I shouldn't trust anything that can fool me once. Which is interesting. Which is like a dream. And it's interesting because of Michael. Right. He's fooled us once. Yes, he has. Could he fool us again? Yes. Well, that's what all the theories are, right? Yeah, exactly. it's not really Michael and... Okay, cool. And um, Moravec, who is actually still alive, he's done really? extensive research okay. into robotics and artificial intelligence. So he's more of a AI guy who's okay. a technologically savvy, a bit more so than Song Su would be. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> um, Moravec has this to say about consciousness. Our consciousness is the only reason for thinking we exist or for thinking we think. Without it, there are no beliefs, no sensations, no experience of being, no universe. And when talking about consciousness after death, as our brain and bodies cease to function in the normal way, it takes greater and greater contrivances and coincidences to explain continuing consciousness by their operation. We lose our ties to physical reality, but in the space of all possible worlds, that cannot be the end. Our consciousness continues to exist in some of those, and we will always find ourselves in worlds where we exist, and never in ones where we don't. The nature of the next simplest world that can host us after we abandon physical law, I cannot guess. Does physical reality simply loosen just enough to allow our consciousness to continue? Do we find ourselves in a new body? Or no body? Whoa. Wild, right? Yeah. The one line that I really like is... um. We will always find ourselves in worlds where we exist and never in ones where we don't. Right. So we'll always exist in some form. We may not. Right. Okay. I was just thinking of how you can get lost in a book and the book doesn't contain you. Mm -hmm. Right. But in that reality, you are the one reading the book. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're still technically part of it. (laughs) I don't know. That's that's interesting. Very cool. Yeah. I love all this simulated reality stuff. It's so interesting. It's really fascinating. Kind of creepy. (laughs) Yeah, because what a lot of these people are saying is there's no way to prove one way or the other. So there is one experiment that was done to disprove simulated reality or the matrix reality idea Mm -hmm. that we're all in a simulation. And that's to calculate something that would be impossible to calculate. Right. So something that would overload the system if it were a simulation right the idea was to come up with this equation that would overload the system but the problem with that is 
that would only work based on this reality's law of physics or law of mathematics. And who's to think that we're a simulation in a universe that doesn't adhere to these laws of mathematics or mm. something completely different? So, again, <laughs> you can't even disprove that because yeah, that sucks. But it's like what Chidi says, you know, just in case this is real, yeah. let's just continue on being who we are, being kind to other people. Because as cool as these theories are, if you live your life believing that none of this is real, mm, you're probably not going to have a great life. Yeah, you're not going to have many friends. People are going to think you're a jerk. Yeah. It doesn't I mean, sound very fun. Maybe you won't be a jerk. Maybe if you just think it's not real, you won't do anything. And you'll just be waiting for death. And that's and, also not pleasant. Yeah, that would just get old. Yeah, that wouldn't be very fun. I like what Descartes says about not trusting your senses as well, because there's always those moments where you think that you heard something or you kind of smell something, but no one's making anything and not in a like smelling burnt toast, going to have a heart attack, right. brain aneurysm, Stroke. whatever thing. Stroke. Yeah. That's the one. Um, plus then mental illness comes in there too with hallucinations, delusions, those kinds of things that you feel are true, but are not true and can be actively harmful to you and your way of life and there's also the exploding head syndrome which is um some people have that before they go to bed they can hear a loud noise like a bang or people talking huh uh, apparently if anybody's listening and they hear noises before they go to sleep or a bang that is kind of normal not normal but it's it's more common than you might think Oh, interesting. It has a horrible name, Exploding Head Syndrome. Yeah, not great, not great. Yeah. Well, thank you for looking all that stuff up because I 100% forgot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really cool. I like that. That's fun. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're going to go over any of them in the next coming episodes or if they're just going to toss that aside and they were just get for on the viewers. to the next thing. Just a little okay. tidbit. Hey, you guys, if you want to look this stuff up, these people. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Or it could be the subject of his next lesson or his first lesson. Yeah. I think Let's it might talk be. about simulated realities and how you can't prove them one way or the other. <laughs> Simone thinks she's in one. But that just, be interesting. just d don't. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so overall, what did you think of the episode? It was a great whole hour long episode. It was not a great <laughs> single episode. 20 minutes. 100% should be watched along with the first episode. Yeah, I agree. They but need to be cut together. Other than that, other than some, a couple of jokes that just didn't land for me, I thought it was still a good episode. It mm -hmm. moved the story along. It did its job. And I'm excited to see what comes next Thursday. Yeah. This now Thursday. that we've got the intro out of the way, let's get into the, the whole clam chowder of it all. <laughs> the surf and turf of it all. Yeah. We don't have much of a mailbag for you today, but... Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Danny for sending a email to us. Um, it wasn't just an email. It was a novel. Yes, it was definitely hand, like hands down the longest email we've ever gotten. 100% and we loved it. It was fantastic. It was the best email ever. Danny sent us her thoughts about basically every episode that we did in season two and three. They were so fun. Um, I loved reading all of it. Thank you so much for sending us that. And if anyone else wants to send us their thoughts via Twitter, via email, go for it. I love hearing what you guys are thinking. Yeah, send us a play-by-play -play of your thoughts. Yeah. If you were eating Surf and Turf when we started talking about it and Jason didn't know what it was, I want to know these things. You Tell wanted me. to, like, you spit out your water going, how could you not know what Surf and Turf is? Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Yeah. I want emails like that. <laughs> so... Send it our way, uh, Multiverse Radio. If you'd like to be entered to win a Fork and Bull shirt keychain, then send us a message through any of our social media using the keyword Surf and Turf. Ooh, you gotta have that keyword if you want to be entered in for the draw. We're gonna pick someone randomly, so... Send us a message on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, or, or on Twitter, Multiverse Radio, or our email... Which is info at multiverseradio.ca. This has been Forking Bullshit, a Multiverse Radio production. If you are a fan of our show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. And you know, if you like us, 
We're a free show. We don't put ads in this thing. If you like us, tell someone about us, right? Spread the word. Get those good points. Tell your friends, your neighbor, your reformed demon daddy. Go for it. Demon daddy? I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. See you next week. Bye.